close. They tell you about a person. Are they preppy? Are they thrifty? Do they put much thought into where their clothes are made or under what sort of conditions they're made? Uh, clothes reveal loyalties to a brand, an organization, a team, or a school. They reveal an occasion. Someone who walks into a hardware store in the midst of a home repair project will be dressed very differently, you hope, from someone who is going out to celebrate their 30th anniversary. And both of those people will be dressed differently from someone who is celebrating their 21st birthday. <laughs> Clothes are also aspirational, in a sense. Does a doctor really need the white coat in order to perform a surgery? Do a judge's robe somehow make the ruling more official? Or do these clothes actually highlight for us the weight of the office that those individuals hold? Clothes can cover the individuality of a person in such a way that it, it highlights the, the greater system, the greater cause that they're a part of. When they put on these things, they're not, no longer Steve or Ruth, but they're doctor and judge. Shortly after I came to St. David's, I was making a visit at a hospital near Dallas, and I went in and got on the elevator, and there was a hand that reached out to hold the door, and there was another priest that walked in. I said, should I call you Father? And, and he said, no, no, he's, I'm a Baptist. He was wearing a clerical collar. He said, I'm a Baptist. And he said, this clerical collar is the only way I can find any respect around here. <laughs> he said, it opens patients up when I go into their room. They're more willing to talk to me. And it probably helps that, that they don't think I'm someone coming up from billing or social services or something like that. Who are these robed in white? The elder asks St. John in his revelation. Clothing plays an important role in the scriptures, too. Not only at the end in the book of Revelation, but at the beginning in the book of Genesis. We're told that when Adam and Eve, our primal parents, disobey God, they suddenly feel a sense of nakedness, of shame. So they cover themselves with leaves. Shortly after that, God comes along and he provides them actual clothing made from animal skin, which is a sign of, of God's grace towards them and towards all humanity. Remember the story of the prodigal son. The prodigal returns, and what does the father do? He says quickly, bring the best robe and put it on him and, and get my signet ring and, and give that to him as well. We're going to celebrate his return. And these clothes and jewelry, they they reveal both the father's grace and the son's reclaimed identity. This is who the son is, not someone who has to eat the pods the pigs eat and pine for something better. Do you know what it's like to be clothed? Imagine the embarrassment of walking into a party underdressed. What do you do? Conversation might, with others might be a little awkward. You feel like everyone might be looking at you, and you're probably right, they would be. All of a sudden, the host pulls you aside. You're certain that you're going to be asked to leave. Instead, you're told that there are some extra clothes in a spare bedroom upstairs that would fit you perfectly. All of a sudden, you find yourself feeling confident again, like you belong. Clothes have the power to make you become a person that left your own devices you might not otherwise ever be. I think that's probably why St. Paul, in his letter to the Galatians, chapter 3, says, everyone who's been baptized into Christ has been clothed with Christ. Baptism, he goes on to say, uh, makes the distinctions of the world, distinctions like Jew and Greek, or slave or free, or male or, or female, makes them non-starters in the church. They don't matter if you've been baptized. Because being baptized is 
is about more than, than the distinguishing marks our world gives us. The best the world can come up with is categories like progressive and conservative. But in the church, you discover that radically different kinds of people kneel beside each other week after week and drink from the same chalice as they're made one in Christ because of a common baptism that you share together. You've been baptized, given the name Christian. In just two weeks, we're going to baptize another child. Christian is a weighty name to give to a little child who's completely helpless and dependent on its parents. And yet, the church, for thousands of years, has done this. It's a name that we grow up into. It's an identity and a vocation we grow up into. Why? Because we've been clothed. We've been clothed with Christ. And through that process, we are made something more than we could ever make of ourselves. Well, back to this morning's reading from Revelation. The elder answers his own question. Who are these? These ones who are robed in white. They are the ones who have made their garments white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, no matter how familiar you are with church and how many times you've read that passage or heard that sort of terminology, it's weird. It doesn't make sense. Uh, if you go home and, and look at your Tide detergent, lamb's blood will not be there. Okay? It's weird. It's bizarre. What, what is he talking about? Now, I know you've been waiting patiently for a Mother's Day illustration and here is your Mother's Day illustration. If a mother lamb dies, the other mother lambs will reject her you. And eventually that you will also die. So what shepherds will often do is they will take another mother lamb and they will prick it and they will take the blood and smear it all over this orphaned you. Because only when the mother can smell herself on a lamb, does she know that this belongs to me? She'll accept the you as her own. I don't know what good that's going to do on Mother's Day, <laughs> but I hope it's helpful here for the sermon. <laughs> and what the elder is saying is that those who stand before the throne of the lamb are able to be there because the lamb recognizes him recognizes them as his, as his own. He recognizes them because he, they are covered in his blood. They are covered not anymore in their sin and in their wickedness and in their vile offense, but in the grace of God that flows from the wounded side of Christ. They've been covered in his blood, which means that they've been made like him, pure, spotless, without blemish or defilement, in short, they've been made pure through his blood. As that old hymn says, our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. To be Christian is not to be holy because of your inherent goodness and piety. No. It's to be accepted by God as a child of the Lamb. To be more than you otherwise would be left to your own devices, because God graciously reached down to you in a time when you couldn't respond, in a time when your sin had taken you far from him, and as the psalmist says, laid you on his shoulders and carried you back. In my previous parish, we were two blocks away from, the, from downtown and three blocks away from the hospital. So I had a wonderful privilege of of serving as an on-call night and weekend chaplain there at the hospital. One morning, about 2 a.m., phone rings, and the operator tells me that there's a lady in ICU who wishes to make a confession. When I arrived, I found a woman who was in her 40s. She was struggling. She was struggling to breathe. She was struggling to hold on. The cancer had spread throughout her abdomen, and she wasn't expected to make it more than the next few hours. Her mom left the room so that we could talk. 
woman said she hadn't been to church in years, but she felt that she had to make a confession before she went to meet her maker. I told her, I said, I'm not Catholic. I just, I want to give, it was a, it was a Catholic town. And so I said, I, I want to let you know I'm not Catholic, but if, if that's important to you, we can try and find a Catholic priest, even, even at this late hour. And she said, an Episcopalian? Well, does your forgiveness count? <laughs> I said, no one's ever come back and told me it didn't work. <laughs> she mustered a laugh and, and continued with a, a grisly confession. It was hard fought. Uh, she spoke slowly, quietly, but she managed to get out everything that was on her heart. I returned in the morning to discover that just after I left, she had slipped into a coma. And just before I got there, she had passed away. Her mom said to me, I think I have an idea about some of the things she confessed to you. I want to let you know that, that when you left, I came back in the room and it was like my little girl was back. In all her innocency, in all her youth and beauty, she was there. And I thought, that's just like the lamb, the lamb at the center of the throne, to wash a sinner like her in his own blood, to clothe her in his own pure white garment, and to carry her safely home. Amen. <laughs>